Most people see the game of Monopoly as a harmless bit of fun. Others view it as a crash course in the dark side of the American dream. You start the game with the same amount of money as everyone else, but your goals overlap and you begin taking things from one another, exploiting one another in your times of need. And one by one, you fall into bankruptcy at the hands of your rivals. There's no mercy in Monopoly, and a little bit of bad luck at the wrong time can ruin you. I love board games, and growing up, I played a lot of Monopoly. To this day, it's the only game I've ever flipped, table and all, and that's happened more than once. Monopoly has a way of making you crazy, and that's kind of the point of it. It sets you at each other's throats, and it's sudden. Random swings of fortune can make the calmest people lose their tempers. In that sense, it's a lot like real life. Skill matters, but not as much as luck, or your willingness to rip off the next guy. Like most of those classic games that dominated the tabletop landscape before the board game renaissance of the early 2000s, like Risk and Battleship, you win Monopoly through very confrontational gameplay, where you advance by taking things directly from other players or by wiping them off the board. You learn a kind of uninhibited exploitation and the virtues of ruthless dominance. At the end of the game, one guy is left standing in possession of everything. The other is driven to a state of fictional cardboard and plastic despair. Lately, games like Carcassonne and Settlers of Catan have brought more nuisance and skill to board gaming, where you win through competing projects that allow all players some degree of ongoing success. And today, I'm suggesting you add another game to your collections, out of principle, The Landlord's Game, also known as Monopoly 1.0. It looks like Monopoly, but it's anti-Monopoly. More accurately, it's the original Monopoly that was renamed and repackaged in 1906 in one of the great intellectual property thefts of the 20th century. It was invented by a woman and stolen by a group of businessmen who refused to credit the game's real inventor. Elizabeth Maggie, the true creator of the landlord's game, hated real-life monopolies and invented this board game in order to criticize them. She designed a game where fortunes changed suddenly and pointlessly, and where getting ahead in life was only possible through cruel and predatory behaviors. Lizzie was an early feminist who insisted on equal pay and equal rights at a time when those ideas had little traction. She ran her own business and owned her own home with several adjoining acres. She was born in Illinois in 1866 to an abolitionist newspaperman who had, incidentally, traveled with Abraham Lincoln during his campaign for governor of Illinois. In her fight against injustice, Lizzie became obsessed with the ideas of an economist named Henry George, who believed that land should be taxed rather than income and that the remainder of these land taxes should be redistributed among those who needed it most. She designed the landlord's game to illustrate the evils of monopolies and also as an object lesson for George's theories to demonstrate the effectiveness of the land tax for fixing the American system. There were two different setups for her game, one for each part of her project. The first version represented unfettered capitalism. The point was simply to gobble up properties and destroy the competition. This so-called Monopoly version of the landlord's game was in Lizzie's view the boring version. After all, what's the fun of bullying others relentlessly on the way to victory? The second version showed the effectiveness of George's single tax theory in real time. By adding restrictions to the capitalist free-for-all of the Monopoly version. In the official rules to her game, she says of the first version, the landlord's game is based on present prevailing business methods. By this simple method, one can satisfy himself of the truth of the assertion that the land monopolist is monarch of the world. The remedy is the single tax. Of the second version, Lizzie said, If the players wish to prove how the application of the single tax would benefit everybody by equalizing opportunities and raising wages, they may at any time during the game put the single tax into operation by a vote of at least two of the players. 
Guess which version people actually liked playing? The all-out competition of friendly annihilation, or the object lesson in obscure tax reforms? Lizzie shared the game with family and friends, and they played it constantly. Convinced she had a hit on her hands, she applied for a patent in 1903, and in 1904, she received U.S. Patent 748,626 for her game on January 5, 1904. Primitive versions of the game spread quickly up and down the East Coast, and it became popular on college campuses. But two years later, Charles Darrow, a domestic heater salesman from Philadelphia, quote, invented a new game in his basement. The game was called Monopoly and it was basically an updated version of the landlord's game that located her gameplay in Atlantic City. It skipped the idea of the land tax and focused solely on financial domination, not as an illustration of a sick economy, but as a business ideal. Having seen Darrow's version, Parker Brothers reached out to Lizzie and offered to buy her patents for $500, with the understanding that they would publish the landlord game and promote it around the country. Not only would this help spread her political ideas, but it would bring in huge royalties as the game's popularity grew. But Parker Brothers had something else in mind. They only wanted to buy her game in order to prevent the possibility of lawsuits. They had already committed to publishing and promoting Darrow's version instead and wanted to protect themselves from a lawsuit. In order to trick Maggie into selling them her patents, Parker Brothers mailed her a prototype of the Landlord game. She was giddy with excitement. She said she felt, quote, a song in my heart at the sight of it. Quote, you will publish other games of mine, she said to a member of the company. Quote, but I don't think any one of them will be as much trouble to you or as important to me as this one. And I'm sure I wouldn't make so much fuss over them. Once they had conned her into a deal, Parker Brothers released Darrow's Monopoly, and it was a smashing success. In the years that followed, he would become the first ever millionaire game designer. Maggie's earnings ended with that initial $500, and she died in 1948 at age 81 in relative anonymity. It is only recently that Lizzie has received some of the attention she deserved. Her original version of the game is now available online, and if you are interested, you might grab a copy and let us know what you think. You might also find adapted versions of the Landlord game, like one called Anti-Monopoly. Whatever you think of Georgian economics, we should all appreciate Lizzie Maggie as an American pioneer and innovator whose critique of America's dog-eat-dog economy played out so compellingly in her own life. She never had any real political power and was exploited by Darrow and Parker Brothers and their Darwinian economic worldviews. Monopoly made all of them filthy rich, like rich Uncle Pennybags rich. And beyond the initial 500, she never saw a dime. So as a matter of principle, I'm buying the landlord game, even though it frankly sounds like a pretty boring, far too educational game for my tastes. And I'm probably done with Monopoly, not out of principle, but because I finally have proof that this game was designed to enrage me.